The um, ESL Foundation uh, is an Austrian foundation and it's member of a European association of foundations called the European Foundation Center. And within those, this large group of foundations, uh, there's a smaller group uh, that are dedicated to work uh, uh, towards creating a more inclusive and accessible world. It's called the Disability Thematic Network as a part of the European Foundation Center. This is a small group of some really dedicated foundations uh, and this session is dedicated to their work. Uh, so uh, some of them uh, that are part of this group will present their current work, their current projects um, and uh, guiding you through this session is Letizia Manzoni who is the coordinator of this disability thematic network group within the European Foundation Center. Over to you Letizia. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I actually would like to introduce right away uh, the new CEO of the European Foundation Center, who uh, kindly joined us today uh, to give us a little bit of uh, uh, a landscape and setting the scene for us of the session today. Uh, Delphine, over to you. Thank you so much, Letizia, and thank you for inviting me to do and inviting us as the EFC to participate to this event. And of course, it's, it's well researched that um, the one billion people living with disabilities in the world are in normal circumstances experiencing disproportionate levels of poverty, violence, abuse, neglect. Um, the people living with disabilities face additional costs, have lower incomes and face higher unemployment rates than people living without disabilities. Um, these issues labor discrimination are in turn very closely connected to inequalities in access to education, vocational training, housing, and a lack of access to transport. Sadly, all of these issues have indeed been aggravated in the pandemic. And at the EFC, as Michael um, alluded to, we have been working for these issues for many years, trying to address some of the systematic inequalities that people living with disabilities uh, face, and that within the context of that disability thematic network. And members of our disability thematic network really focus on supporting their grantees in every aspect of their activities. And we've seen, I thought, what's quite interesting over the past years that there's been an increasing attention in making sure that they have the utmost flexibility and uh, redu reduction of administrative barriers for grantees so that we can really respond um, to the real and pressing needs of uh, people living with disabilities. Within their work, we've seen that our members uh, very much stress the importance of considering the group of people living with disabilities in all its diversity. And within this heterogeneous group, uh, we know that women, children, um, as well as the elderly are facing additional forms of, uh, discipline, of, of discrimination. And it's with this mindset that in addition to having disability as a specific area of focus that throughout the EFC, we also believe that disability is an issue to be mainstreamed in all areas of our work. It is a cross-cutting issue and it can be addressed within any foundation's program supporting inclusion, diversity, education, employment, arts, culture, healthcare, and in fact, every aspect of life, because the interests and needs of people with disability mirrors those other groups. So mainstreaming disability is for our members really understood as an invitation to build disability into existing processes rather than adding separate disability activities. And sometimes it can be as simple as having an accessibility uh, policy for websites based on existing standards. So while as philanthropy our contribution in the grand scheme of things is modest, we do believe that philanthropy with its grant making, its convening and its knowledge power can be a real catalyst for change. And it is placed in a unique position to support the rights of people with disabilities. So I'm delighted that we'll be hearing today from four members of the European Foundation Centre who are very active contributors to our disability thematic network. And I very much look forward to learning more about their work on supporting and creating more employment opportunity for people living with disabilities and also on how they mainstream a disability inclusive approach in their work. Um, we'll also have the opportunity to touch upon the importance that networks have in exchanging ideas 
in generating evidence and in promoting collaboration, which is at the heart of the work of the EFC. So thank you so much for being here and thank you, Letizia, for giving me the floor. Thank you, Delphine. Thank you very much for this introduction. And I would like to uh, get directly into our session uh, with our first speaker, Anna, Anna Juvino. Uh, Anna has over 20 years of experience in the disability sector uh, linked to the ONCE Foundation from Spain and its social business uh, uh, group in uh, different positions. Uh, ranging from training and employment of people with disabilities to project management, uh, institutional and international relations, and much more. Uh, and Anna is going to uh, present a project carried out by, by the ONSE Foundation, uh, which is called Digit Digital Talent Academy. So I would like to give the floor to Anna, and I know she has a presentation also to show to us. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Letitia. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so good evening. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, this program, for Talento Digital, which means digital talent in English. And I will start with some, some uh, background information. Uh, so, according to the World Economic Forum, by 2025, employers uh, will divide work between mach machines and humans equally. Automation will displace 85 million jobs, but 97 million new ones will be created. And 50% of workers will need reskilling or upskilling to keep their jobs. Even nowadays, uh, the increasing job uh, offer in the technology sector is not covered because of the lack of qualified professionals. We all know the pandemic has uh, accelerated uh, digitization and automation uh, far more than expected. And it also has revealed the importance of digital literacy for everyone, but also at the same time, the lack of digital accessibility. Uh, in terms of training and employment, accessibility is especially key for persons with disabilities. They, they sometimes find it uh, hard to improve their education or their qualifications in the digital and technological fields due to the lack of accessibility of programs, of software, uh, digital environments, etc. So, uh, after a number of isolated actions in this field for a few years, in 2019 we launched for Talento Digital, which is a permanent, a permanent uh, training program uh, focused on digital skills and technological jobs aimed at improving uh, the employability and competitiveness of persons with disabilities in this increasingly uh, digitalized labor market. So in short, putting people with disabilities on the digital talent map. And uh, our vision or what we want to do is to become a preferential partner for companies with an inclusive uh, digital talent approach. Also to be a reference for persons with disabilities interested in getting training for digital and technological skills and technological jobs. And uh, also to raise awareness on accessibility in digital products and, and environments. We have four main goals. Uh, the first one is uh, providing and improving digital literacy of persons with disabilities. Second is offering training uh, for the most demanded technological jobs. Uh, also meeting the specific demands of employers through ad hoc or co-designed training pro uh, programs and adapting the professional profiles of persons with disabilities to the digital requirements of the labor market. In 2020, despite the pandemic, uh, we were able to launch around 550 training courses and train almost 4,000 persons with disabilities, uh, of which 47% uh, were, were women. Uh, as a reference, in 2019, the first year of the program, pre-pandemic, the number of participants was 6,500. And to achieve that, our training program includes digital literacy, as I said, uh, upskilling courses to uh, increase the labor opportunities of persons with disabilities in those non-technological jobs that suddenly require certain digital skills to be performed, and also advanced training for specific jobs in the digital or technological field. 
Here you can see some examples of the courses we were offering last year. Uh, we had basic, medium, and high-level courses. And uh, for instance, under the basic and medium level, we had uh, digital literacy, uh, Microsoft Office, digital citizenship and identity, communication and collaboration in digital environments, basic cybersecurity, social media, internet, and uh, apps and platforms for, for job seeking. And uh, for the most advanced courses, uh, we've been focusing on those fields or jobs with a higher demand. So the top position is held by programming, and we have offered different types of programming courses, web in different uh, programming languages, mobile, uh, full stack, etc. We have also started some courses uh, related to video games, which are very attractive for, uh, for young people, like uh, quality assurance uh, or video game testing, video games accessibility. Uh, also, uh, very highly demanded uh, were those jobs in the field of digital marketing and e-commerce. And we are also training entrepreneurs uh, to be able to undertake the digital transformation of their businesses. Uh, we also offer grants uh, for digital or tech-based programs, masters, specialist courses, certifications, and the grant covers 80% of the tuition or registration fee, up to 10,000 uh, euros uh, per student. And the grant program launched in February uh, 2020. And last year, we were able to award to, uh, 46 grants, amounting 140,000 euros. And uh, thematic areas were very diverse. For instance, 3D printing, graphic design, video game design, uh, programming, big data, uh, audiovisual contents, microcomputer systems, and even um, digital uh, post-production in fashion, beauty, and advertising, for instance, no? as some examples. Um, a key element in our program is uh, partnership with employers. Uh, they can get involved in many different ways. They can offer internships to our students as a first uh, job experience after a training course. Of course, they can offer jobs. They can participate in mentoring programs. They can uh, deliver master classes. They can offer study visits. We can uh, co-design or create um, ad hoc programs for them to cover the specific needs. And they, uh, for sure, provide us with first-hand advice on labor market needs. And another very important part of the program is the comprehensive support we offer to participants. For instance, we provide allowances to cover extra expenses incurred when participating in trainings like transport, childcare, personal assistance. And based on last year's uh, learnings, uh, we have recently launched uh, a digital grant for online training uh, to cover internet access, devices, software, of course, uh, accessibility is also a must for us. So we offer sign language, captioning, assistive technologies, and finally, uh, group and individual support, which is especially key for some types of disabilities, such as intellectual, developmental, or psychosocial. Uh, we really believe uh, digital and technological jobs are the future, but that future that seems to be so far away is getting closer and closer. So uh, we will keep on trying to, to increase our scope and our reach and, and to scale uh, our project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for sharing your projects. And indeed, 2020 was the year we realized, started to realize that the future is really more and more online. Uh, so projects like this are absolutely crucial to actually defend and you know, um, develop the rights of people with disability and the access uh, for everybody to the online world. And I would like now to introduce our uh, second speaker. So we pass from Spain to Turkey. Um, Ozen Pulat is, uh, uh, works at Sabanchi Foundation as program supervisor, uh, which uh, Sabanchi Foundation is one of the leading foundations in Turkey. Uh, 
Um, and Ozen, uh, she has been working uh, at Sabanji Foundation for over eight years, uh, where she mainly oversees the social change programs of the foundations, especially the grants program aiming uh, to promote access to equal opportunities for women, youth, and persons with disabilities. And uh, she is going to uh, present to us a project called Job Coach Employment. And uh, hi, Ozen, over to you. Hello, Letizia. Thank you for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ozan. I am uh, the program supervisor at Sabancı Foundation. We are based in Istanbul. And I will tell you a little bit about uh, Sabancı Foundation and also one of our uh, grantees. I will share my screen right now. You can see it, right? Yes, we can. Okay. So Sabancı Foundation uh, is uh, 46 years old. Actually, it's 47 almost. And as Letizia said, said, we are working for women, young people, and people with disabilities. Uh, we are a member of European Foundation Center and also its disability and gender thematic networks. So our activities can be focused on education, culture and arts and social change. And today I will uh, tell you a little bit about our social change programs, especially the grant program. Uh, so our grant program focused on also women, young people and people with disabilities. So every day we have an have a open call. Uh, we collect applications from all over Turkey. And that's how actually we um, know more NGOs working in the sector. And this is uh, one of our projects from previous years. Uh, the project's name is I'm Independent Because I Work. It's the Job Coach Supported Employment Program. Uh, it's uh, implemented by uh, Down Syndrome Association in Turkey. Actually, they were one of the Zero Project awardees in 2017. We were uh, together in Vienna, and uh, they also presented their work uh, that year. And they still continue. So the program uh, has been implemented since 2012. And the pro problem is, of course, the social prejudice and incomplete education that force people with disabilities and especially Down syndrome to stay at home and out of work. And, and the solution they offer, they offer various programs uh, and job coach approach to uh, people with Down syndrome. Uh, it's important to note that in Turkey, there is the uh, labor law that says if a company or a public authority, if they have more than 50 employees, uh, at least 3% of the employees should have disabilities. So the law uh, says that, but still, when we look at the number numbers of uh, people with disabilities in employment, it's very critical. It's critically low, actually. As far as we know, there are 9 million people with disabilities in Turkey, but uh, almost 80% of them, they are out of uh, labor force, so they do not work. It's The number is too high. And when we uh, look at the numbers with people, uh, for people with mental disabilities, with psychological disabli disabilities, the numbers are more critical. So uh, sometimes the problem is the just discrimination. And sometimes the problem is the families who are too protective for their children. Sometimes the problem is uh, the companies that think that people with uh, disabilities, especially with Down syndrome, they cannot adapt to the workplace, they cannot adapt to their colleagues. So the problems are can be varied, but uh, we know that the law exists and we need some innovative solutions. So with the program Down Syndrome Association offers, actually they have consultation uh, for people with Down Syndrome, for their families and workplaces. And they help people to set their career goals. They enhance their skills. They uh, do the job matching, actually, it's very important. And they have various trainings before, on the job and after the training. And they also have some awareness raising activities for the companies. 
So when we look at the model, it includes like they first find young people with Down syndrome and they also find workplaces that are interested in joining this program. And their motto is right person for the right job because they think that we think that uh, everybody can work uh, if, you, if you give them the chance, if you also adapt the environment for their needs. And after finding the young people and workplaces, they first give training to young people about work life, about using money, about going to the workplace or they also give trainings about the specific role at the company. At the same time, they inform, family, inform families on how to support their child during this period. They uh, prepare families to get ready that their children will work and will uh, earn money like any other people. Uh, on the company side, they provide training to all staff at the company, all the colleagues that uh, the uh, person with Down syndrome will be working together. So when the when he or she arrives, uh, all the colleagues are trained and they are ready uh, for this new employee. They also provide on-the-job trainings to young people at least two week, for two weeks, and they start slowly. They start give distance um, with the job coach and the employee, and they start to monitor uh, the new employee by phone or monthly reports from uh, its manager, from her or his manager. And finally, they provide support if needed. They're always there, the job coach, they're always there and they support, they provide support if needed. When we look at the numbers since the program started, uh, more than 100 people with Down syndrome started working in 40 companies in 15 cities in Turkey. Uh, the numbers are very good, but uh, the most important number is the 88% uh, of them, they still continue working, of course, until COVID. Uh, right now, they cannot uh, continue like uh, many other people, but uh, before that, the numbers of continuation, uh, it's amazing, actually. Young people, they received like hundreds of hours of preparation training before work, and they also continued to get trainings on the job, during the job. So the job coaches, they accompany the employee during the work. So the education at the training, it still, it continues. And the uh, uh, NGO, they trained uh, 49 job coaches uh, so far. We work with them for uh, two years. And it's very good that they still continue to grow these numbers. Uh, these are some pictures from uh, the target groups. And uh, yesterday, when I talked to the uh, officers from the NGO about the current numbers, uh, they also told me that last year before COVID, they had a very uh, good collaboration with the Turkish Employment Agency, which was the sustainability of the project, actually. So they started to train um, people from the employment agency to be job coaches, actually, which is very good because uh, you need to finance uh, to uh, develop new job coaches. And if you give this model to the, of, to, of course, to the government, it can continue. So they started this collaboration. Uh, and I hope after the pandemic, uh, they will continue. Yes, I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Azen. Thank you, Azen. Thank you very much. And speaking of collaboration, um, our third speaker uh, is actually right on the point uh, of this topic. Um, Joy Morozov, she is a senior managed international partnership at Light for the World. Um, Joy is a Lebanish, Lebanese British national who has uh, over 15 years of experience working in the private sector with organizations such as the Economist Group and in the humanitarian sector, where she has been building rewarding partnerships with the philanthropic community uh, with the aim to transform the lives of people with disabilities. And uh, Joy has a vibrant cultural sensibility that she has acquired from uh, years of living in different countries, from the United Arab Emirates, uh, to Saudi Arabia, to the UK, to France, Switzerland, and now Austria. 
And uh, Joy says of herself that she is a fervent believer that building and belonging to the networks is a way of life. And this is exactly the topic of uh, her intervention, uh, which is the importance of networks to exchange ideas generate evidence and promote collaboration to bring down uh, silo work. So, Joy, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. And you should unmute yourself. Uh, absolutely. I always preach <laughs> the most important world in our dictionary these days is to unmute yourself, and I still do the same. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of um, you know, this, um, uh, this, this speaking area for, for us. Uh, it's very dark and extremely cold here in Vienna today. And I realize that you must be all extremely tired. So I'll keep my thoughts short and sweet and to the point. So uh, Leticia, you've given me a fantastic introduction. So thank you so much. One little detail is you probably see that I'm wearing um, a light blue scarf, which is keeping me warm. It's a scarf that was given to me at the European Foundation Center's event in Paris back in 2019, when we all used to meet each other, greet each other, hug each other, which is a luxury that I do not have these days. This scarf was given to members of this fantastic event, the most memorable event I've ever uh, been to, um, back in France, uh, in Paris. It was symbolizing liberté, égalité, fraternité, meaning in English, freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Of course, I would not go into a lot of detail about the amount of discussions that the French have gone into over history about what this signifies, because the purpose of our uh, talk today is why we are here, why we are at the Zero Project, is really to promote freedom, égalité, and brotherhood. Now I'm mixing languages, which is one of my big issues, but we'll put this aside. Why we are here today, because we are wanting to break the barriers. So today's presentation is about, not French history, but it's about the importance of networks that you have, um, and I won't go, um, much more into detail about the, the topic, and I will elaborate on it now. Um, I would like to explain what I mean by networks, because to some people it means different things. To some people it could be, I'm networking to get a job. No. This is about, the, for, for today, a network is a formal organization with a membership structure and a core staff that delivers services to the members and engages the members in the governance of their affairs. So it's about giving value add to the members. And it is led by uh, an, uh, you know, a structure that is accountable to its members. And that's quite important to look, uh, to look at this uh, for the purpose of this um, presentation. Now, I can spend a number of hours to explain why uh, networks are uh, so important. Uh, we all know that our mission is to create a fair society to people with disabilities. Uh, but for the purpose of brevity today, I will just focus on how I see networks contribute to philanthropy. And it is, this is mostly my perspective, what I have been observing uh, you know, over the years. Of course, I've read some, uh, you know, a lot of evidence, some reports, but this is how I would like to summarize it, because, as you know, we could spend many hours talking about this. Um, to me, I see that it is actually um, networks, there are different aspects of them, and they all work together to make a whole. So first, I see networks um, as an opportunity to generate data, peer-to-peer -peer learning and best practices. So for example, Delphine, you so kindly uh, spoke about you know, the disability thematic network and we are members of it. That's led by uh, Michael and uh, Leticia. We are a network of foundations working on breaking the barriers for people with disabilities. So we meet on a regular basis under the umbrella of the European Foundation Center who are made up of 
foundations, a network of like-minded practitioners led uh, by the wonderful Delphine. So as part of our work, what we did was we produced this publication some years ago where uh, we did a survey of what foundations are doing in terms of um, the work that they're doing in disability inclusion. So we use this publication as a material to pass to others, to teach others, what are they doing? So it's a best practice material. So that's one thing that you can see here in front of you today. Uh, other, uh, when I mentioned about generating data, testing the temperature, when the COVID set in, there was a survey that was done uh, by the European Foundation Center of its members to see how the foundations are reacting, how, how have they responded to the COVID-19. And that was something that we managed, to, it was turned around very fast, only because there is a whole network that's working together. Now, I would like to talk about a network facilitating collaboration to solve problems. I, always, I am a person who likes to solve problems. And as members, we're all working towards solving a problem in our context. It's how do we bring down barriers for people for disabilities to have equal access. One example I would like to point out is what Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did. They uh, teamed up with the Welcome Trust and MasterCard when the COVID uh, came on board, they mobilized work together, the members of the EFC, and th this collaboration resulted in doing a speed development and access to therapies. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is networks give one voice to its members. We're all together and we're able to communicate with other members of the networks, with other members, with other governments, for example. Um, there are thousands of examples I, I could give on how a one voice can make a, a huge difference, but I, will, I won't go into, uh, into more detail. Another aspect, networks stop duplication of work, of work. When you are working as part of a network, you're exchanging on, on activities that you're doing, and that means you don't do the same things as what others do. And here I would like to take the example of the Barrow Cadbury Trust, who partnered with the National Lottery Community Fund, all members of the EFC, again, to mobilize some uh, funding and a response for the COVID-19 re response. So I've just given some examples uh, here, which uh, I hope gives a bit of a flavor of what NextWorks is about. And I would like to repeat again that they all work together to do something extremely powerful. And networks are all part of a huge system. And uh, when I talk about huge system, you have networks that work together with community foundations, with academia, with think tanks. And I won't go into more detail. There are many players in the whole system that contribute to one cause, delivering a fairer world, a fairer world where people can enjoy freedom, equality, and brotherhood. I hope this has been a very interesting conversation for you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you very much. And if I'm not mistaken, we should have our first presenter also on uh, the call. Um, and our first presenter is from Italy. Uh, Elisabeth Franchini uh, is from Lucca, but she was born in Australia. Uh, and Elisabeth works as a program officer for Fondazione Banca del Monte di Lucca. Uh, since 1991, and she has been a long-standing member uh, of the Disability Thematic Network of the EFC ever since the uh, foundation joined in 2008. Um, she has uh, taken care of important projects. Um, some of them, uh, one of them, for example, is uh, City of Lucca becoming accessible or uh, the European Photography Exhibition Award. And she has also uh, strongly promoted uh, the League of Historical and Accessible Cities, uh, which is another project born within the uh, Disability Thematic Network of the EFC. And she has been participating in the Zero Project Conference for several years. Um, and Elizabeth is going to uh, present to us 
uh, a, a publication and a project that was again born uh, among the members of, of the Disability Cinematic Network regarding uh, accessible events. Um, hello, Elizabeth, and uh, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for delay for my technical problems. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, something has already been said by Letizia. We are part of the disability thematic network uh, that is uh, a thematic network inside the European Foundation Center. Maybe you can go with the second slide, please. Thank you. As you can see, we are part of this uh, disability thematic network and ESL Foundation, Mr. Michael Fenbeck is our chair. So we are learning a lot from the Zero Project uh, conference that uh, takes place uh, annually since 2013. And uh, we are, were inspired by their publication of 2019 because they decided to make uh, um, the guidelines of accessibility, uh, learning from their experience and their huge uh, um, help and network uh, during the conference. And uh, as foundations, uh, you can go on on next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as we are involved in disability too, we thought that we had uh, uh, a good experience uh, to share with our peers and some good practices and examples that we could uh, give everyone. Especially in this period with the pandemic of COVID-19, we found that uh, helping to make accessibility uh, in all our events, uh, and especially the ones that are online, like this uh, uh, amazing conference, could be a good idea. So we decided to put together our knowledge in this publication because we thought that making events accessible, as he said on the top of the slide, is a journey, not a goal. But you never get anywhere if you do not embark on that journey. We embarked on this journey a long time ago, so if we can uh, move to the next slide, please. This is just a, a few examples of what you can find inside the publication, because we think uh, and we thought and we decided to give some tips on physical accessibility, like creating ramps in the area of the conference you decide to uh, prepare. If you need an elevator to go reach the stage, you need sometimes some short bistro tables for wheelchair users. The registration desk has to be lowered. When you make the promotion of the event, you can use uh, the social media and the mailings, uh, but using mainly visual materials. And the photos that you can share have to need uh, alternative text. Videos uh, have to be described with captions. The registration form has to be accessible and you need to reach as much as information uh, you can to um, encounter the needs of your guests. And if we can move at the next slide, please. Can we go on, please? Well, anyhow, you can also make an evaluation of your event so you can learn uh, what is uh, to what you need to improve or what is working well thank you and then there is uh, um, another kind of accessibility that we can call cultural accessibility if you are an organizer of uh, uh, exhibitions uh, or events uh, uh, you can uh, heighten visitor experience uh, reproducing the artworks uh, even with uh, something simple like bread or common uh, objects. You can prepare uh, relief prints. Uh, we, for example, can use a black and white drawing with special microcapsule paper that give a relief of one millimeter that it's uh, good for people with uh, uh, visual uh, that are visually impaired. And it's very important also to use material that is into braille or printed for visually impaired people with uh, fonts and uh, uh, large size characters. The caption and the signage can be made uh, with character, characters and fonts that are uh, usable from everybody. And when you organize a guided tour, 
maybe you can have a sign language interpreter for deaf people. So, and thanks for the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Anyhow, our uh, mission now in these days and objective is to invite and to encourage foundations and other conference organizers to read about uh, the experiences that are given from the Zero Project Conference and also from our publication as members of EFC and DTN. You can find the publication on the website on the virtual library of the EFC, and I think these slides can be um, readable after the session. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I'm asking. Anyhow, you can find the link directly on the EFC website. Thank you very much, and sorry for technical problems. Thank you, Elisabeth. Thank you very much, and no worries. And nowadays, in this online world, technical <laughs> problems, I feel like, are the new normal, uh, let's yeah. say. And uh, thank you to our four uh, amazing presenters. And I know that there have been uh, a few questions um, written in the chat behind the scenes. Uh, so I think Joy had a question for one of the other presenters. So feel free to un unmute yourself and take the floor, Joy. Thank you. Now I'm really unmuted. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you so, so much for your, uh, for your presentation. I know that um, we all worked very hard uh, on it, this presentation. I have a question for you because I know we've uh, spoken a lot in, in, in the past. Can you give me an example of, uh, you know, when you worked on a project and then you saw a person with disability appreciating art? Just give, give us a bit of story because I'm a huge fan of you know storytelling just to make it a bit alive. Thank you, Joy, and nice to see you, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, the experience is very interesting because uh, uh, we found, for example, that when we make the laboratories where there are tactile uh, elements uh, or the possibility of making um, an experience uh, like a blind people in the exhibition, you find deaf people, for example, that want to try to be blind. Uh, So-called normal people that want to make the experience as a blind people and like to make all the experience also tactile and not only moving around the exhibition. And everyone, for example, when we made it for a, um, a photography, uh, exhibition was amazing to see the photographers making the experience of being guided to the descriptions of the images and the pictures that sometimes uh, was their own image and picture mm -hmm. so it was strange to see people trying to understand the feelings that can give uh, photography blinded or touching it or by the description of the guide. And they all appreciated it very much. That's for sure. That's incredible. Have you ever done any statistics to see how uh, the attendance uh, you know, to the museums uh, went up? Uh, any statistics to see how? No, 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 not on the other places. But for okay. example, we always have uh, uh, the book of visitors in our um, uh, exhibition center. And we always at the end of the exhibitions go and see what they are, what are their feelings about what we are doing. And they are all reactions very positive. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks um, to you. Uh, Ozan, I had, a, uh, I had a question to you. Uh, thank you, for, uh, you know. Thank you for such an inspirational story on uh, how you've, you know, how you've managed the 88 percent. I mean, this is fantastic, and this is like a statistic that is um, really to congratulate you, yourselves with, um, and that's how you see that the project is sustainable. In your opinion, um, which has been within because you know you've got different elements of the project that really work very well together. In your opinion. Which was the most challenging? Was it to get the commitment of the families to support this, or did you see others? 
Uh, thank you, Joy. Uh, actually, congratulations to the Down Syndrome Association because ju we just supported them. Uh, it's their uh, project. And as far as I know, they got the model from Italy and Ireland. Uh, so they replicated in Turkey by adding some cultural elements, let's say. Uh, as far as I know, the most difficult part is actually to uh, get the companies in the program because uh, this is the biggest barrier uh, for employment of people with disabilities because you can uh, talk to the families, you can make them ready for their uh, children to work because they just need to believe in you and they just need to trust you. And people with uh, disabilities, they are, they are ready. They're just waiting uh, for the right program, right educational program and the model. But for the companies, they have all kind of other uh, opinions on the table, other like uh, prejudices, backgrounds. So uh, I think uh, I mentioned about the law uh, that forces actually companies and public authorities to employ people with disabilities. Otherwise they have to pay uh, fines to the government. So it's, it's a win-win situation actually. Uh, when the association is very successful, uh, for getting the companies in the model because they have so many like from small to big organizations big companies they all uh, brought them to the program so they are very successful in uh, talking to the companies and they are bringing them in the model and they really uh, pay a lot of time attention to companies so that they feel ready uh, to employ uh, someone uh, with down syndrome or other mental disabilities because most of the time they are just afraid uh, to do something wrong. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest problem is with the companies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, um, Ozan and Elizabeth as well. I, I actually had um, a question for, for Anna. We have uh, a few minutes left. Um, and I was wondering, um, throughout the duration of, of your project and while you were uh, building the, the partnerships uh, with the employees, um, what was the biggest challenge in that? Because I feel that sometimes uh, in you know, the, the business world, uh, there is a, a misunderstanding with respect to uh, how uh, people with disability can contribute. And sometimes they're more seen as a liability uh, than an actual, um, than, than an, than an actual uh, you know, support. Um, uh, so I, I was just wondering if you, uh, you know, in that relationship, what was the biggest, biggest challenge um, and, yeah, any additional, uh, you know, guidance that you want to give on that? Uh, yeah, um, as, as Ocean uh, said, uh, in, uh, employers usually uh, are afraid they don't know how to deal with people with disabilities. They don't really know uh, what people with disabilities can do. And uh, so you can find that resistance to, to change. Uh, so the best way to, to, to make them um, change in this, in this sense is trying to involve them in, in our programs. Because if they are uh, really involved in the trainings, if, if they can see what uh, persons with disabilities can do in the technological field, in this case, in the digital uh, field, if they um, get some of those students as interns uh, for a few months and they can see what they can really do, I think that's the best way uh, they can realize how how, uh, how important it is to to give them an opportunity and, and how they can really perform if they are given that opportunity. So sometimes only uh, making them aware of uh, the possibilities of of their uh, of their their capabilities and and the fact that in most cases they only need uh, an additional support. But they can perform as any other employee. So I think that that's the most important thing: trying to involve them, not, not trying to to teach them, but to 
get them involved in, in the programs. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, and I actually had one last, very last question for Joy very quickly. I, I was curious um, if she, she, she has been a part of, of the Disability Cinematic Network for, for a long time as well. Um, and I was wondering what were, you know, the highlights of your experience within, you know, the ESC and the Disability Cinematic Network? Thank you. I love this question. Oh, so many. Um, I would say the highlights were really learning about it. When you work in civil society, you're working for, you know, um, we're designing uh, programs to bring the barriers for people with disabilities uh, in Burkina Faso, in Uganda. So you're very much like working from the field, convening people from the field, and you're really very focused on your program that has got all the different components working together to make it sustainable, scalable, replicable, and cost-effective. But when you take part in the disability thematic network and you see the practitioners in the world of philanthropy working, you really can draw learnings. And a lot of times I bring what I hear from the disability thematic network, you know, our webinars, our meetings. I take them back to my colleagues and say, okay, this is what I've learned. This is what they're doing in their projects in, in Ireland, for example, um, or in Italy or in Turkey. Wouldn't this be really interesting? So this is what I take back, is really the, the learnings from other uh, uh, areas and friendships. You know, I can, if I'm working on something and I'm hesitating, I don't know, I pick up the phone and I'll speak to, you know, to Elizabeth or to Ozen or, and, uh, and we say, okay, help me with this. It's really peer-to-peer -peer learning and, and like a support group. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joy. And I would like to uh, close the session because we are one minute away from the ending. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say huge thanks to everybody who, held, uh, who helped uh, organizing the session, uh, to all our speakers, uh, Delphine for joining us, uh, and of course, Michael for uh, being the best chair of the network. Uh, and I think uh, we can uh, take out, what we can really take out of this session is that uh, the philanthropic sector is placed in a unique position uh, to foster change and to support the rights of people with disabilities. And uh, this is what we are uh, keep going uh, with and we will do uh, even, uh, you know, with more passion and um, and, and willingness to, to really change uh, the world and making sure that it is actually uh, a world with no barriers. So thank you very much to, to everybody for, for participating and contributing. <laughs>